consciously take that off. So when you start functioning like the old person, like the unbeliever that you once were, you need to knock it off. That's what he's saying. Take it off. Get rid of it. So we are officially past the halfway point on the book of Ephesians. Sure. And uh, what we've been doing is every single day this week, we've been uh, blazing through one chapter at a time of the book of Ephesians, just reading it together and talking about it together. And that's it. Just very, very simple. So today we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter four. So let's open up the Bible together. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And we'll end that right there. Now, this passage is making a very strong case for unity. And how important is unity in the church body? Well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's of utmost importance. I mean, there's no, no question about it. In fact, what I love about this, this entire chapter, and I realize we've got a lot to talk about here, but... In this chapter, there is a major transition that takes place. So in Paul's writings in particular, uh, in this in this uh, writing, the first three chapters are theology. Mm -hmm. They're all the uh, indicatives. Uh, they're all the objective truths. From chapter four onward is the imperatives. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, what, how, this is how I want you to live. And in fact, he says that, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, right? With all humility and gentleness, with patience. Bearing with one another. So it's just it, it, all of this is, is culminating to the fact that the church of Jesus Christ is a united body. OK, so there's that global aspect of the church of Jesus Christ that is a global body. Now, he's talking to a specific church, a local church here. Um, they believe that this letter was circulated to other churches as well. So so he's getting the message across to all of these people that listen to that. You have to be a united church. And he uses that language, one spirit, one faith, one one baptism. Uh, you were called to one hope. You were, you have one Lord one, and, and one God, Father of all, over all and through all and in all. So, so the idea that we have to walk away from here with these introductory verses is if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you are in the body of Christ and you have a responsibility to function within that body, okay? And the overarching goal within that functioning is unity. We have to be working towards unity with one another. Now, I think it's very important to understand this. Out of all the different organizations in the world, we are very unique. Uh, what's the one thing, or rather we could say, who is the one thing that we have in common? Well, it's Christ. Christ is the one thing. You know, we have one Lord, one faith, one God, Father of all. And so, so you have all of the, this eclectic group of people that comes together with all kinds of different histories and baggage and, and talents and gifts. And we all come together in a local congregation with one thing in common, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That means there's a lot of diversity within the body. That means there's a lot of potential for disunity in the body. And this is why Paul makes such a big deal out of unity in the body. Right. And I think the unity is perhaps one of the most powerful examples that there is a yes. real work That's right. of the Holy Spirit that Wild actually changes us. Right? That's right. So, yeah, it's really, really important. Let's read verses 7 through 14 together. But, the, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. 
and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Mm -hmm. So in this passage, verse 11 here, it talks about how God gave the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers, mm -hmm. What's what's the purpose of these different ministers within the church? Well, he tells us in, in the text, he says, for the equipping of the saints, right? Uh, and, and our church hears this all the time for me. Uh, and, and by the way, this is one of one of the passages that's a gifting passage. There's First Corinthians 12, Romans 12, talks about the gifts of God. Even in even in uh, verse eight here, it says he gives he gave gifts to men. That's a that's an interesting passage. We don't have time to dig into. There's a lot of controversy. The Apostles' Creed has one perspective of it. Uh, probably uh, we're talking about the condescension of Christ to the earth. But you know we can wrestle through that one at another time. But I think the point here is this that um, with with the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers, these were all gifts that were given to the church so that the church would be equipped. He, he goes on to talk about so that we may, may no longer be children tossed to and fro by and, and carried up, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and dece deceitful uh, schemes. So we have to understand something. You, as a follower of Christ, your goal is to grow up. Now, I don't mean to be condescending with that, but my goal, Tim's goal, all of our goals is to constantly be growing up. And God gives us certain people in the church to help us grow up so that we will be mature and, and not easily swayed by different doctrines that come swooping in, heresies and different things that can cause disunity in the body. So what's, what's a key to unity in the body? Making sure we all understand correct doctrine. And so he gives us pastors, teachers, and, and so forth to help us who, who, who hopefully are rooted in the scriptures. And this really puts a pressure on uh, pastor, shepherd, teachers to make sure that they are rooted in the scriptures so that they are able to teach it to the congregation, thus propagating uh, continuous unity within the body. Mm -hmm. You know, it's I've thought of this passage many times about, you know, equipping them so they can go evangelize and stuff. But it's amazing to think about how they also are equipping us to be unified. That's right. And, and that seems to be a major emphasis of this text. Well, it's interesting cool. in, in John, John 17, it was even the prayer of Jesus mm -hmm. that, that we would be one, right? Right. And so if we have one thing that we can be unified about is his revealed word of God. Now, that's a tall order. And right. it takes a lot of work. And we have to be diligent in knowing and understanding and doing a proper hermeneutic so that mm -hmm. we understand what the text of Scripture is saying. But it's a good work. Right. And it's a work that we should be given to. Absolutely. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, through verses um, 15 through 24. It's a little bit longer of a passage than we've read so far, but bear with us. There's a lot of really good stuff in here. So let's read verses 15 through 24. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this I say in testifying the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through the deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness 
and holiness. So this passage, it talks about putting off the old self, putting on the new self. I think this can, even though this is in the Bible, this can kind of become a Christianese mm -hmm. that a lot of people don't understand. So can we just put off the old self and put it on, like put on the new self like a hat? What does this mean to put off and to put on? Well, I think it, when you read the text here, uh, I always talk about it as a garment that you are to pu pu pull off the old. Because look, in the text, it says, you have not, but don't, don't live like you used to live. Right? Don't live like the Gentiles. Don't, don't do that. But in verse 20, but this is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have learned about him and were taught in him. So I love that Paul throws that in there. Assuming you're a believer, assuming who you are. And I think that's a good thing that we don't always, we, we, we need to be careful not to assume that someone is a believer in Christ, right? Uh, as as uh, truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self. Okay, Who's that? Who's he commanding that to? He's not saying sit back and have God take that off of you. Mm. He's telling the Ephesians, no, you put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and it is corrupt through deceitful desires. So we are participating with God in the sanctification process. He doesn't need to do that, by the way, but he is choosing to do that. So we have a responsibility to stop it, mm -hmm. to stop functioning like the old life. We have to consciously take that off. So when you start functioning like the old person, like the unbeliever that you once were, you need to knock it off. That's what he's saying. Take it off. Get rid of it. But he doesn't leave it there. He says, now you take that off, but you also have a responsibility, he says, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Again, this is, this is really a focus of our responsibility. Certainly God is superintending and empowering us. We just saw that in the last chunk of scripture. But right here, this onus or this responsibility is placed on the believer. He says to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So we put off that old person and we consciously put on the new person. And, uh, and, and that's what he gets into in the next chunk of scriptures of what that actually looks like. But I think the, the, the key takeaway here is our responsibility. We, we can't blame this on everybody else. God says, you believer, you have a responsibility to put it off, put the old person off, and to put the new person on. You are actively engaged. In mm. Mm. Excellent. All right, we're going to wrap up this chapter, read the last uh, few verses here, verses 25 through 32. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Mm. So when we read this passage here, basically, like you said, the first half of the book was a lot of kind of theology. And now we're getting really practically just list yeah. action after action after action. Could you maybe pick one or two of these that you think might be especially relevant no. for our time? <laughs> no, <laughs> you're killing me. Um, this is a four week sermon series, but <laughs> so I'll do the best I can. So just to recap in just prior to these verses, he's saying, I want you to put off and put on. Mm -hmm. Now he's giving us specific put offs and put ons. Mm -hmm. this is, this, and so you need to see that when you're reading through the text, right? Mm -hmm. So let's look at it. Therefore, having put off falsehood, I want you to speak truth. 
with your neighbor. Okay. He's mm-hmm. talking specifically, he's, you know, certainly the principle is for speaking truth everywhere, but specifically with believers, we're to mm-hmm. speak truth with one another. Um, he says, put off anger and do not sin. Right. Mm-hmm. He says, he says, be angry and yet do not sin. Uh, that means it's possible for us to be angry. Mm-hmm. Jesus was angry. He flipped over the tables mm-hmm. in the, in the temple, right? He was angry, but it's also to be possible to be angry and yet not sin. Mm-hmm. Now that is a sermon in and of itself, and I can't even go there right now. So you call me and let me know if you want me to talk to you more about it. Uh, He says, let the thief no longer steal. So stop stealing. Mm -hmm. But instead, I want you to get to work and work with your hands. Why? So that you can accumulate everything for yourself. That's not what the text says. The text says, I want you to stop stealing from your neighbor. And instead, I want you to work so you can give to your neighbor. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. So you're putting off thievery and you're putting on work so that you can give. He says, stop talking with corrupting talk. What's corrupting talk? It's it's nasty tearing down talk. Okay, it's not a lot of people look at this and say, oh, don't swear. Don't cuss. That's not what he's talking about. We shouldn't swear and cuss. Okay, but that's not what this text is saying. It says, stop using language that tears down another person. Mm -hmm. Parents, be very careful about this, that we need to be very careful how we speak to our children. We need to be careful how we speak to each other. Do the words that you use tear down or build up? He says, don't don't speak with your mouth in such a way that tears people down. But he says, but only as such is good for building up as fits the occasion. And it gives grace to those that hear. The principle that's, that's here is when someone's done talking to you, they ought to feel built up. Mm-hmm. Even if you have to challenge them. They still ought to feel loved and built up. And then do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Okay. And so did we get to there yet? Was that where we went? Uh, Verse 30. Okay. So, so again, he intimates here that the spirit of God is at work. And, and when you are living in the put offs, when you're, when you're being angry, when you're lying, when you're, when you're using your language for corrupt talk and tearing down people, that's going to grieve the Holy spirit. And he's like, I'm out. I'm not going to empower you for that stuff. Mm -hmm. Don't grieve him. uh, Because remember you were sealed by him Mm -hmm. for the, to the day of redemption. In other words, Paul is saying, you remember who you are Mm -hmm. and, and the way you live is important. I think that's a very important principle for all of us to understand that if, you know, yeah, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven, but it's got to show up today. Absolutely. Um, so we want to be careful that we don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We were sealed unto the day of redemption. So he says here again in verse 30, very specific, put off and put on. He says, let bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put off from you. There's that language again. Put it off. Take it off like a nasty old robe. Mm -hmm. And instead, I want you to be kind to one another, Mm -hmm. tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Why? Because you have been forgiven as well. And when you when you understand that he wants to remind everyone. You're a believer in Jesus Christ. You have been forgiven much. And so you must forgive. And you can read Matthew 18, the parable in Matthew 18, that really, uh, really solidifies what Paul is talking about here. So to be a believer in Jesus Christ means it will manifest itself in how we live. Mm -hmm. But you know what? We have a responsibility to put that stuff on. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul is trying to tell the Ephesians. Yeah, so I guess the kind of the question we have coming from here is, if we are truly changed, can people see the change? Yeah, right, exactly. Well Well said. Well, that wraps up Ephesians chapter 4. We hope you'll join us for our next video where we read Ephesians chapter 5.